Okay, see you later. Bye. So good, uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to uh, to chair this panel. Uh, we will be discussing on on COVID, of course, like many other sessions. But we will try to focus on the post-COVID area and see what uh, what is going to happen once all this is over, and also focus on the financial institutions. Um, so per, uh, perhaps um, I can ask uh, each of my panelist members to present uh, him or herself uh, for what considers me, I'm Edwina Jens, I'm the Managing Director of the International Banking Federation, representing the banking industry worldwide. Colin, why don't you start? Thank you so much indeed, and, and, and good morning, Dash, good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Colin Hunt, I am the CEO of AIB Group. Uh, AIB Group uh, is a Ireland's leading retail business and corporate bank, uh, and I've been enrolled here for about two years. Great, absolutely. Nandini. Uh, thank you, Hedrick, and uh, I'm Nandini Sukuma. I'm Chief Executive of the World Federation of Exchanges. Um, we represent market infrastructure around the world, both exchanges and CCPs, so at the heart of the capital market system. We um, have among our membership, we have about 300 members uh, around the world, 300 market infrastructures around the world. They range from the largest, uh, all the US markets uh, like ICE and CME, CBO, NASDAQ, etc., but also uh, the smaller markets uh, around the world, both in the Americas, but in other regions as well. So uh, a very, uh, a very broad panoply of market infrastructure around the world. We're a standard setter. Uh, we work on resilience issues, uh, and our focus is really uh, systemic stability. In addition uh, to all the other kind of virtuous things that public markets bring. You. Great. Then we have uh, Russell Saunders as uh, a speaker. Unfortunately, he's not on my screen, but he might be able to talk. So, Russell, please come on in. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear, hear me. I can hear you and ah. see you. That's great. Oh, excellent. Um, top apologies. So, so I'm Russell Saunders. After well, more than thirty years working in a global uh, financial institution, uh, more recently I'm on a board of a one of the challenger banks, but I'm also on the board of of SWIFT, Global SWIFT, and um, Pay UK. Um, so I've had a, a immense experience in uh, global transaction banking, but now dedicating myself into ensuring that global payment traffic flows uh, during these troubled times. We're very glad to be here. Thank you, Russell. And Marguerite, please. Thank you, Adwich. Um, Margaret Sutterman. I am an employee from Aon. I work as chairman of the executive board of Aon Holdings in the Netherlands. Aon is a risk advisor, professional services firm. We're active in 120 countries with 50,000 people, uh, active in the fields of people and risk. Uh, and especially in these challenging times, of course, there's a lot of risk. I look forward to discuss it in more detail. Thank you, Adwich. Great, absolutely. So uh, normally we had a, a last uh, panelist member, but I can't see him on my screen. So I um, I propose that we kick off with you, Colin, with the first question. So of course, uh, COVID nineteen, we talk about it all day. Um, as a, a quite of introductory question, what are for you the key lessons learned uh, from COVID nineteen, and how do you see those lessons impacting? the banking business model. Thank you very much. I think that COVID-19 has been a health, social and economic crisis like nothing we've ever seen outside war. But in terms of how it's going to impact on, on the long-term environment that we all face, I think that it's 
leading to an acceleration of a long term, three long term secular trends. Um, we've seen 10 years worth of change in the space of about 10 months. And those three long term trends, which have been moved on to a steeper trajectory as a consequence of COVID, are digitalization. We are undoubtedly leading more of our lives online, uh, and we will continue to do so. Uh, and uh, we've seen that in terms of how our own customers engage with the institution, significant falls in terms of cash usage, um, ATM withdrawals, branch visits, and more and more of our customers uh, using our online facilities. Uh, just to give you some context around that, we have about 40,000 customers visit our branch branches on an on a, on a, on a average day, uh, and that compares with about one and a half million digital uh, interactions uh, with our various channels now. Uh, the second major change is, uh, as one that's going to persist, is it's fundamentally altered how and where we work. Um, about 80% of our headcount are now working from home. We surveyed our staff uh, last year, and they indicated that they, even in a post-COVID environment, they don't want to return to the office uh, five days a week. Uh, so I think that businesses are going to have a hybrid operating model where people will work from home for part of the week and work in the office for the rest of the week. Uh, and that's something that's going to be with us uh, in perpetuity, I believe. And the third major uh, trend it's had an impact on is sustainability, uh, in that um, there was a view at the start of the pandemic that the health crisis was so severe that we needed to push the sustainability agenda to the side and, and just focus our energies and focus our efforts uh, on resolving the immediate crisis at hand. But in fact, I, I think that uh, this crisis has exposed the fragility and the frailty of the world in which we live like nothing else. And if anything, it's pushed the sustainability uh, issue further up the agenda of business and further up the agenda of our customers and indeed uh, policymakers. In terms of its impact on the market, and particularly the banking market, it, it's been quite severe. It has uh, led to uh, an expectation that we're going to be dealing with even lower interest rates for even longer than we were prior to the, uh, the, the, the crisis. It has led to a very significant increase in liabilities in the form of customer deposits uh, across the banking industry. It has created an environment where loan growth is sluggish at best, uh, and all that basically has conspired to put a, a, a significant challenge on the profitability of the sector uh, globally. And to a large extent, I think every financial institution, every financial body is responding to that challenge using the same playbook. So there is an increased emphasis on, on, on cost reduction to greater use of digital technologies. Uh, and there is a, a, a major emphasis on um, providing a major emphasis on having a swing away from uh, net interest income as a source of your revenue streams and towards greater fees and commissions. Uh, that's something I expect to see playing out right the way across the sector globally uh, over the next number of years. And ultimately, it may well lead to uh, pressure for inc increased consolidation. Um, this may well be a catalyst for increased uh, consolidation in market and cross-border. Uh, uh, but that's probably a little bit too premature to be speculating about uh, what form that will ultimately take, but I think that pressure will inevitably arise. Mm -hmm. Yes, great. That's uh, that's a wonderful uh, wonderful overview. Nandini, if I can turn to you, um, uh, seeing from the financial markets, uh, what, uh, what are for you the major trends and events that you want to put forward? Um, thank you, Hedwig. I, I mean, apart, I think Colin did a really good job, actually, of encapsulating some of the themes uh, that everyone in financial markets is living. Um, from our side as market infrastructures, we obviously we are exchange and CCP. Our members are exchange and CCP. So we are the organizations that operate or enable public markets to operate. And what we saw, if you, we, we could sum it up really the theme of 2020 and 2021 uh, is twofold. One, the resilience agenda, and two, the recovery agenda. And I think Colin, in his three points, has spoken uh, effectively of both of all three of them, both of those, uh, both recovery and resilience. 
In terms of the resilience agenda, what, what we saw in 2021 was interesting and unusual. And I'm not saying it's unusual because of volatility. In every crisis, you expect volatility. You see enormous volatility. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing from Marguerite on that, I'm sure, a little further. But what you saw in the last year was amid the volatility, there was a call for the first time to close public markets. So there was somehow uh, put forward as, as a suggestion that somehow it would contain volatility, it would lead to calmer markets uh, if you close markets. And as a result, you saw uh, in jurisdictions around the world, this debate play out. I think that all of us certainly uh, on this panel and it, it, in the audience, perhaps, I'm sure as well, uh, are very clear that you must not close markets, especially during a pandemic. You know, this is a time for continuity, for consistency. The rule books that guided, you know, financial markets, the playbooks must continue, especially the regulatory, um, the regulatory requirements. So that was an, an interesting and perhaps existential moment I would say for all of us uh, on this webinar, we we worked through it. Um, I think by the end of the year, there was clarity that you know public markets, exchanges, and CCPs are too essential part. Of, they're just too essential to close. Um, so maybe you know having a better understanding of how much other stakeholders. Uh, such as banks and intermediaries, uh, issuers, etc., use them. One of the most interesting things, though, was that the, was markets have remained open, and you've seen that really in the first quarter as well. We're having record issuance. Uh, issuers are coming to market. They're fundraising. Um, you know, uh, their inflows, tremendous inflows, uh, etc. So this is all not only because of the stimulus package, uh, but just a wider usage, if you like, uh, of the way that stakeholders are using markets. I would like to say in terms of the recovery agenda, um, looking ahead, ESG, absolutely, as Colin pointed out, but a couple of other themes for us as well. And if you look uh, for us as an industry, how we have defined our priorities uh, for 2021. Obviously, operational resilience risk remains a key priority that speaks to the resilience agenda. Um, and that includes cyber and all the things that go with it, you know, enterprise risk, uh, etc. But also uh, ESG, which is the res which is the recovery agenda. But we think also about the role of retail, because you've seen retail volumes rise and rise as a theme in 2020 and in continuing to rise in 2021. What does that mean for all of us? Uh, the rise of retail, what does that mean? Because that has you know, fairly profound implications. Um, we think also a little bit around risk. You know, uh, CCPs or central counterparties mandated in the wake of the G20, you know, um, to take risk out of the system um, are very much uh, very focused on, you know, the issues that they need to contend with uh, as you manage risk. And we think obviously about sustainability, but we think now finally as well about what is what does an inclusive recovery look like? Because one of the themes of this pandemic has been that it hasn't it wasn't a financial crisis that bled into the rest of the economy. It was, if you like, a health crisis that became a societal crisis that has led, you know, to a financial crisis. So I'm going to stop there and I look forward to hearing from the rest of you. Thank you so much, Nandini. This is a, a great, uh, a great add-on um, for this conversation. I can't see Russell for the moment, so I propose. Yes, okay. Russell comes in, please. Yes, Russell. Uh, okay. So, uh, a question I would like to ask you is, uh, as you you've said in the introduction, you have current roles at the UK and SWIFT and giving you an excellent view on the complexity of global operational systems. So um, from your perspective and in those roles, what would you see as implications of COVID-19 on uh, resilience and financial stability? Mm. Well, I'm um, looking at this from um, the domestic market infrastructure for the UK, which is Pay UK. 
and then the global market infrastructure uh, which connects all geographies up uh, cross border with swift um it, it, there's a very interesting uh, correlation between the the volume and value of uh, payments traffic and trade traffic and the resilience of economies um and it is it, on the on reflecting on collins views we saw a huge dramatic downturn uh, correlating with the with the various lockdowns uh, but lastly we've seen volumes and values return to pre covid levels so there, there is an optimistic um, view to this as well if if the the relationship between uh, gdp and payment volumes uh, continues as as i suspect it will um just drawing on that though uh, the the one of the messages i i take from this current pandemic and uh, the medical crisis which we've tried to avoid becoming a financial crisis is that the banking community generally and in the uk specifically has learned the lessons from the uh, the crisis of 12 years ago um and perhaps because of the regulatory restructuring of balance sheets um and the disciplines that have followed uh, the the banking in- industry has been able to cope um and and we can see that in most of the mu- mature uh the, the mature com- economies um as is borne out more recently with the with the bank of england's assessment um which was a judgmental assessment they 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 didn't undertake their 2020 stress test which they would normally do and reverted to more um their more uh, judgmental assessments and uh, and this seems to be borne out by the major banks reporting in in q4 of last year where core tier one ratios have either stabilized or improved actually uh, the liquidity has been um, pretty much stable uh, and uh, customer deposits have grown uh, the I, th- i think it's fair to say that probably the well off have got uh, more comfortable and, and there's uh, so- societal society societal areas that have struggled uh, and that is where some of the, um, the 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 massive help that's been given is beginning to gain traction um and and indeed uh, mortgage transactions have continued as well many of these of course in the uk are sponsored really by some stamp duty holidays and and uh, the the massive exit from big cities into the sub, into suburbs and to uh, uh, more you know more more um uh, less city areas um so there's a lot to be uh, to reflect on and to see in the last Four to five months some um, improvements and if as we do come out of lockdown i'm seeing a bit of a bounce back and i think importantly the financial institutions having secured their resilience have recognized their social accountabilities and not looking at their responsibilities purely through a commercial lens and i think that's something that i'd like to see continuing um against this the next five years uh Collins absolutely correct there's banks will potentially become a debt collector for a uh, government lending government back lending and that's going to create some some tensions um the regulatory environment's not going to get any easier all of the global market infrastructures and domestic banks uh, need to step up with their IT infrastru- infrastructure infrastructure digitization adopting the iso messaging five of the global market infrastructures are replaced in their own uh bank to bank systems such as chaps moving to rtgs2 so there's a huge amount of pressure uh, on the technology side as well um but perhaps because of the move to new ways of working and agile technology as well we're better equipped to manage that so on some of the downsides there's uh, there's cause for optimism as well Yes that's great a, a mixed uh, message uh, really so uh, turning now to you uh, Margaret um, you with your uh, background in insurance and experience of course uh, of many more things do you see like others here in this panel also a positive outcome from uh, covid um, is there a boost to be expected in terms of health industry technology what do you think Yeah, I think that we've already uh, Colin and and Russell and Nandini have already elaborated on it but we're seeing at the moment we're witnessing a fundamental shift in priorities uh, as all organizations around the globe are managing volatility and make decisions in a rapidly changing and a very increasingly complex environment 
This environment was already complex before COVID-19. You know, whether it was geopolitical, whether it was cyber, whether it was regulatory, it was already complex and it has increased. Uh, I think from an insurance perspective, we see that there's a heightened, fo heightened, uh, heightened focus on the long-term nature and interconnectedness of risk. Uh, and we're also seeing that back to what was already said by, by, by Russell and by Colin and, and Andini, is that we're seeing that uh, organizations around the globe from a risk perspective are not only dealing with immediate health risks of the ongoing pandemic, which of course they've done tremendously, but they're also looking now at economic volatility and the heightened risk complexity and interdependence. Now, they're looking at reimagined work environments. Um, uh, indeed, I do also uh, believe, and I'm a true believer, that there will be a hybrid working environment going forward. Uh, we see that there's an expanding health wealth gap, uh, and we have all, you see, back to sustainability, growing concerns related to climate change. A specific uh, emerging priority, which was also just elaborated on, is that you see that employers around the globe the past years have really started putting their human capital first. So they are really competing again to attract and retain talent. Um, uh, and there was also uh, last year, because of Black Lives Matter and all the uh, attention for female leadership as well, there's more attention on how organizations should mirror society as regards diversity and inclusion. So I think the past year we've seen an, an, a very important move that the S of environmental, social and governance actually increased in importance. Now, from a financial perspective, uh, in the insurance industry, um, uh, we can see that um, uh, the mergers and acquisitions activity actually the past years was strong in 2020 despite COVID-19. So we had 407 deals done in 2020 compared to 419 the year before. Um, and it's expected to remain robust in 2021 as rising commercial insurance rates are bolstering earnings and making insurers attractive targets. Um, interestingly, uh, the Fed uh, has just said, you know, that it expects economic growth to rise sharply this year, huh? along with inflation. Uh, and nevertheless, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, is saying that despite this, interest rates are unlikely to rise through 2023. And so, again, buyers in search of returns in a low interest rate environment may therefore actually be even more attracted to the insurance industry. Now, back to the insurance industry, we saw last year an increase of capital of 20 billion, which is it's tremendous again. And um, interestingly enough, if you take a look at the volatility, while capital and capacity are impacting market conditions, a confluence of macro and macro factors are actually, and events are actually key market drivers. And what do I mean with them? Those are an increase of natural catastrophes. Uh, last year we've seen, uh, you know, hurricane uh, season in the US with Hurricane Laura, 9 billion. The total average of losses was around $86 billion. We've also seen social inflation. We see inflation of claims. We see inflation of, of, of class actions. And in, the, in addition to that, we have that already mentioned 0% interest rate environment with lower investment yields. Uh, back to digitalization, because what's happened with COVID-19, and it will be continuing after post-COVID-19, is that we see more emerging man-made risks also emerging. And in this respect, I relate to cyber and the impact of it to society. So McAfee, um, uh, the company actually calculated in December 2020 that the cyber impact, the cyber crime impact for society at the moment is 1 trillion. And that's approximately, if I'm correctly with GDP, global GDP, it's approximately a percent, 1% of global GDP. Um, ransomware incident increased with 486%. And I think it's very important for everyone and each and everyone now, you know, with the risks which have evolved following uh, uh, COVID-19, to take a look at what's your weakest link uh, in your organization, especially if you talk about financial services, it's important to take a look what's the weakest links. And we've seen that this might sometimes not be in your own office. It might be your supply chain with solo winds, or it might be someone close to you. We've also seen breaches that people try to, you know, incidents where people are being attacked in their private environments, not themselves, but their children or their wives. Yeah, for an insurance industry, um, uh, you know, risk is what we do. That's our topic. It's uh, it's extremely important to make sure that we translate and mitigate the known uh, and the known unknowns into the uh, to the known knowns, and we do that back to technology uh, with by use of technology, uh, such as artificial intelligence, but also uh, by sensors, devices, uh, and you know those developments over there are enabling us to do so much more. You know, to, to summarize with the devices, you know, it's there are now fifty. There are now fifty billion devices uh, around the globe and one trillion sensors 
and it's expected in 2030 it will be 500 billion devices and 100 trillion sensors. So the amounts of staggering data which will come along, which uh, will bring new opportunities, but of course also new risks. Back to you, Atish. Yes, that's great. I, I would like to do a second round, if I may, uh, trying to focus on the US, the United States. So, so we have been talking about vaccination rates already. So we've seen that um, after quite a complicated uh, way of managing uh, COVID uh, in the US, we see now that the vaccination rate is uh, picking up uh, very, very quickly. Perhaps we should mute um, unless speaking, that will get better sound quality. Yes, so um, we see vaccination rate picking up very quickly. Uh, Colin, so uh, looking at the US, vaccination rate picking up uh, very quickly, and second, that tremendous recovery and rebooting program from the Fed. Do you think that for the banking industry there, it will make life more easy compared to what we've seen sometimes in Europe with a very strong um, pressure on profitability? So so what do you think, banking industry in the US? Is, is it more simple on, or on? I can't believe I fell for that. I knew they... <laughs> Making a schoolboy error uh, 12 months into the pandemic. Uh, I, I think we all face the very, very same challenges as an industry. I think the US, uh, I would share uh, um, uh, the Fed's outlook for the US economy. I think that we are going to see a, quite a robust recovery there uh, later on this year, but that's a recovery I expect to see replicated around the world. One of the really interesting things that the industry faces now, and indeed the wider economy faces, is that we are in completely um, uncharted waters in terms of policy. Uh, I'm an economist by background and by training. Um, and certainly the textbooks that I read uh, were all always about monetary authorities trying to contain inflation pressures in an economy. But it seems what's going on at the moment is that they're trying to increase inflation pressures. And I suppose deflation is 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 a is, is a far far greater risk uh, to, uh, to well functioning economies than than a small element of inflation. For many years, monetary authorities have been trying to add to inflation pressures. Well, we're currently in a situation across the world where uh, the spigots are turned to the max as well. Um, so you see ultra low interest rates in a European context, negative interest rates, the United States saying it's going to be quite some time before we see interest rates increased or at least official interest rates increased. Um, and simultaneously, we are dealing with a reversal of long term globalization trends. And in particular, I'm referring to uh, the more protectionist approach of the Trump administration, uh, Britain's departure from the customs union and from the single market, and uh, tensions involving China on, on the trade front as well. So there are ingredients in place, I think, for inflation to probably surprise on the upside uh, over the course of the next number of years. And it's abundantly clear, listening to monetary policymakers, that they're not going to preempt that. Uh, certainly the textbooks that I studied when many years ago was all, were always uh, wanted to see what they always uh, related to a preemptive approach on the part of monetary policy authorities that if, if they thought we were going to see an increase in inflation pressures, they would preempt that by increasing interest rates. This time around, it seems that they're encouraging an increase in inflation pressures and that they won't uh, act in anticipation of an increase in, 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 in prices, but they will wait until it's fully embedded. And that's going to have a, a very interesting impact um, over time. And we're already seeing it being reflected alongside improved growth momentum in the long end of the US yield curve. Uh, and 
a large, unlike in Europe, uh, large parts of uh, US credit uh, instruments are priced off the yield curve. So you may well see an increase in, in, in borrowing costs there. Uh, but ultimately, it will lead to higher short term interest rates, not this year, probably not the year after. But I think we are looking at a turn in the interest rate cycle uh, over the medium term. Uh, so we, we do have lo- low rates. Uh, we have uh, it is, we're going to have them for longer than we might have thought, twelve or fifteen months ago. But ironically, I think that the COVID impact will be for ultimately for an increase in one of its impacts will be ultimately for an increase in price pressures and uh, a turn in the interest rate cycle, perhaps earlier than might have been anticipated. Yes, thank you. That's really great, uh, Nandini. If I if I can ask you from a financial markets perspective, you already alluded to the role of retail. Um, so uh, when I've been following the news in the US, what what struck me, of course, was that with the first um, recovery program and PPP, it seemed that a number of um, uh, just individual clients turned to the to the financial markets and the stock exchanges to start trading also with the, the start of uh, very easy uh, platforms like Robinhood, you saw like a, a, a jump of quite new people uh, getting into the, the exchange, stock exchange. What do you think? Is that a, a phenomenon that is there to stay? Um, should we um, also acknowledge um, measures to be taken by supervisors, as we all know that the Biden administration is going to look into customer protection, uh, stability, of course, um, uh, knowledge uh, t- to be assessed by by those platforms. So, is is that a, a phenomenon to stay? Do you expect the regulation and supervising to come in? So, I think um, you really encapsulated. I mean, the, the the title of our session today is operationalizing trust. And I think, you know, um, the, the question and the issue really illustrates some of the, que- some of the uh, questions that we have uh, around trust, especially trust in financial markets, trust in capital markets. The rise of retail is, is to always to be welcome. We're talking about inclusive growth. Um, and so you want retail, you want the man on the street um, to participate in that. With that, there will always come risk because the retail investor is very different from the institutional investor. Um, And you have to have investor protection needs to be obviously at the heart uh, of anything, needs to be wrapped around anything um, where there is retail investor interest and participation. Public markets are open to all, you know, they're they're democratic. Anyone can come. Um, The role of the exchange, the stock exchange, the derivatives exchange, any exchange is to ensure that there are regulated, you know, fair, orderly, transparent markets where any investor, any user that comes gets a, a decent and a fair deal. So how do you balance, therefore, um, the, the the risk and the reward uh, that retail brings. On the one hand, I think that, you know, financial literacy and investor education needs to be a priority. And the, it's both a, a pleasure and a peril because with financial literacy, investor education, we will all spend our lives working, you know, on investor education and there will still be more education to be done. But it needs to be done. And the question that all of us should have is, are the, are the structures appropriate? You know, at the moment, there, I mean, it is in, uh, it, there, there, is, there are legal conversations. So, I mean, obviously, we all uh, need to be appropriate in what we say. So you need to think about, you know, whether indeed, you know, the structure of the market is appropriate. I, I think public markets in the U.S., exchanges for all, you know, they get, you know, told that they're not appropriate, do a fantastic job. The retail investor, you know, has better prices, spreads, all those things than they have ever done. You know, the the trend has been overwhelmingly positive over the last, you know, 20 years. There is, going back to the question of retail education, investor education, we do have to, since we're talking about a societal issue, we have, you know, nothing is free. If something on your phone says, if, if something on your, if you have an app on your phone that promises you free trading, that's great. But there needs to be awareness that nothing is free. 
you know, you need to be aware of the risk as well as the return. I don't think that's a new message. Actually, um, it's written on, you know, every document, probably every public leaflet uh, that Colin and his organization puts out, you know, that Marguerite uh, does, you know, and uh, same, similarly for Aeon. Um, so how do you ensure that on the one hand, the retail investor who must be part of any inclusive recovery is appropriately, you know, protected um, in circumstances, in new times? It's a, di it's a different generation, you know? How do you make, how do you have home the message? Listen, you know, everything, everything needs to be paid for somewhere. I think yes. really wants to come in. <laughs> yes, you're so right. Um, Russell, um, turning on to you, um, uh, as of course you are uh, quite an expert in, in, um, in payments. Um, my question for you would be the following. So we saw, of course, a, a tremendous boom and growth in, in payments platforms in challenger, challenger banks, but also uh, newcomers and, and, and new, um, new kind of platforms specializing in, in, uh, in payments. What do you think about the U.S. markets? I know from my experience that sometimes uh, some of the U.S. banks are considered laggards in, in terms of quick payments, fast payments, so really the modern platforms. So you would think that there is um, a, quite an, a nice appetite for this. So how do you see those platforms also faring in the U.S.? Knowing that, of course, the banking industry is, 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 uh, is quite keen to remain um, the solo um, uh, partner in terms of, uh, of, of, of risk and banking risk and is not always prepared to um, collaborate uh, with uh, commercial firms and also not, not uh, permitted to collaborate with commercial firms uh, from a, a legal point of view. So how do you see the payment markets evolving in the US? Uh, a good question. I'd just like to uh, reflect on what Colin said about his um, his uh, monetary policy training. Uh, although I, do, I did my studies in the late seventies and early eighties, so in a world of um, certainly very interesting times on unilateralism and monetary policy and inflationary measures. Um, but re returning to your question, um, the, I mean, the, it, it is it's a bit of a a contradiction really i've always found dealing with many many good friends in in the us uh not so much at the commercial level but more at the retail level um how behind uh the payment infrastructure and the payment mechanisms the settlement mechanism, mechanisms are to those um in in the uk and europe and um you just traveling through the city through new york it's only recently that you could you know, contactless transactions, and uh, in many many cities, those have been commonplace for you know for ten years now. Um, instant payments or faster payments, and the and the benefits those 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 bring. Um, more encouragingly, though, I'm hearing more conversations amongst uh, central bankers and commercial and retail bankers that recognise the benefits of a faster, more data-rich and transparent transactions. And once you uh, recognise that some of the legacy revenue you've earned on the on the transactions, which are bank to bank, and, and including SWIFT as well as um, as well as bank to bank transactions, um, and you realise that that revenue is coming under threat by challenger organisations and regulations, then you embrace the outcome of the regulators and the consumers and competitors, the competitive market is demanding, and you put your energy into digitization and new technologies and the data richness that can flow in the benefits. Um, and it feels a far more optimistic world now. Um, we're seeing a lot of activity from the, the larger banks. I think um, Jamie Dimon not so long ago used a, a number of expletives to to set the challenge out for his own organ organization and JPMC on, on how they need to face into the challenger banks. And I think that uh, leadership from uh, the large banks and together with the more uh, open, um, encouraging response of the regulators will spark the, the US uh, fintechs to, to, to have a, a new lease of life. 
the other thing is quite interesting, which is in c- comparison with the early 80s, is the introduction of new investment products. I think um, Nardini will know more about this than me, but the, um, you know, the, 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 the SPACs, for example, the, the, the quicker methods of raising funds to achieve quick acquisitions for startups, uh, potentially lowering risk of the startup, but also potentially uh, loading risk in for the future. So I'm, if, if you believe in faster, data-rich, uh, cheaper transactions connecting the world up, as I do, um, then the, mar- the US market has to respond, and I, I do think it will do so, and we'll see a lot of activity in the coming in the coming two to three years. Yes, that's great. And to finish up with you, Margaret, uh, if if we look at uh, the uh, the insurance market in the US, uh, you already alluded to it. So uh, you have the hurricanes. I I think Nandini you should mute yourself. Yes. Um, so if we if we look at the US, um, you alluded to the hurricane. For example, other climate-related risks, so the, the situation can, can move quite quickly, um, and also longevity. Uh, so, with uh, uh, aging uh, population, some parts of the population really shortening their lifetime expectancy. So, how do you deal with that? Because you've, you've alluded to it. Um, data are very important. Yeah. Uh, modeling uh, the, the unknown, unknowns, uh, switching to known knowns. How do you deal with really fundamental shifts that you can have in the in the, the data of insurance markets? Yeah, think, thanks, Hadrish. I think it's very important to to uh, rethink what's happened the past year. We can discuss whether it was a black swan or a grey swan. Uh, it anyhow, it was a swan unexpectedly flying by. And I think that whatever I think it's important that anyone is looking very carefully at how do you mitigate risk? How do you identify risk and how do you mitigate risk? And whether that's in health or in, in your corporate mind, in your business, etc. cetera. Um, and it's interesting to watch, if you watch the insurance industry, we discussed payments, you know, the digitalization. If you take a look, the experience, the customers have experienced the past year with the upcom- upcoming digitalization. They're used to do something with Uber, Amazon, etc. on the spot, instant on demand. The insurance industry will need to actually um, uh, adapt to this new way of what customers actually want to experience. And that's a challenge because it requires a lot more attention for InsurTechs, and it was already mentioned, FinTechs. It requires also a revised view on the future. And it, it requires a realization of leadership that what got you here may not get you there into the future. And uh, so um, in that respect, uh, what for the insurance industry is an additional risk is the IT legacy systems, because we have a lot of IT legacy systems. So there's a there is a demand on any line of business to start really looking, okay, how can we adapt our products and solutions to what clients actually want? Um, uh, it was just mentioned smart cities. Uh, if you indeed go in New York, you indeed can pay contactless. That's all a new way of thinking, a new way of adapting to the new reality. Um, and the insurance industry, you know, we have not done a lot of change the past 400 years, to be quite honest. It requires a complete new of leadership. It requires, if you talk about operationalizing trust, it requires um, to rethink what we're doing. It requires to take a look, how can we, you know, authentically make sure that with empathy that we actually create that trust, knowing what we're talking about, engaging with our customers, good need for the innovation they want. Um and also as a broker, Aon as a broker, we need to make sure our insurance partners, insurance carriers understand that. And just as another example on cyber, just to come back to that simple word of cyber, it's a really, it's, we're sitting there really in a, in a, in a big, in a, uh, it's, it's a challenge because on the one hand, insurers would like to insure cyber, but they don't, still don't know how to actually model it because it's still so many new elements come up with all the new risks of data, which we've seen the past year. Uh, and especially back to the health, if you talk about data and health, you know, um, uh, the, the upcoming data and health have just been tremendous, you know, with, with, with Google Watch, which is measuring your blood pressure, your heart, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think to summarize, it's, it's uh, people want to be heard and people want to be led. I think it's important to realize that you need to listen to the needs of your customers, but that you also need to lead the way yourself with regard to innovation to adapt your products and services to the needs of those customers. 
And I think especially for the next generations, the learning ability will be really key at Vision. So it really means that you should have the curiosity to be still curious, to take a look what's needed, what's required. And even when you've planned all those things ahead, like we want to do, we want to mitigate risk, you still need to realize that every 10 years there will be a risk which you can't plan for in detail. And you need to be able to anticipate based around the team you've uh, and the collaboration with your team which you've built around you. So... Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're nearly on the top of the hour. So if I could summarize it as follows, I think that we can all say that uh, we learned from the global financial crisis and that both the banking industry and the insurance industry are much stronger now to face and fare this crisis. Uh, we heard that there are uh, challenges, of course, challenges not only uh, because of COVID, because, uh, but also data digitization. And uh, I think we, what we need is to keep that trust, the trust that uh, clients have in us, that public authorities have in us to fare and to be there. And uh, we have to modernize uh, and to speed up uh, in terms of embracing digital, embracing modeling, embracing the new things. And uh, I think over, all in all, the experts around this table are ready to, uh, uh, to keep up and to continue. So thank you all of you and um, see you uh, next time. Bye.